I've got 902, so why don't we get started? I think we've got the majority of our participants uh, in on the webinar. So my name is Dan Prue. I'm the membership manager with the Greater Vernon Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, the topic, uh, of course, is COVID-19 and the law. Extremely timely, and I assume some of you are dealing with situations perhaps that you've never seen before. So uh, we've got our experts on hand here, uh, Veronica and Pamela. It's a two-for-one deal, uh, both sharing the same camera. So uh, uh, I will um, take the uh, opportunity to introduce you here. So Ukraine, it's workplace law group is a boutique firm based out of the Okanagan, which provides strategic legal and human resources support for employers throughout British Columbia. Veronica Ukrainitz has been practicing management side employment, labor, human rights, and privacy law for over 25 years, and has also worked as a human resources manager, a restaurant manager, and a freelance writer. Pamela joined Ukrainitz Workplace Law Group in 2017 after practicing employment law in Toronto for 10 years. She has a varied practice that involves assisting employers with issues arising from hiring and terminations and everything in between advocating for clients' interests at courts and tribunals, as, where, as well as conducting workplace training, seminars, and workplace investigations. So thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to you in a sec. I just want to let everybody know that there will be opportunity to ask questions uh, via the chat box, if you would like to, uh, at those opportunities. Uh, but for now, I'll turn it over to the experts. So I'll stop sharing my screen here. <laughs> All right, hello, good morning. Um, Veronica and I, we saw some familiar names on the list. It's too bad we can't see your faces, but hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, Veronica and I, um, we were trying to figure out what uh, information to share and we decided to, um, to kind of explain or discuss our kind of our most common questions that we're receiving from employers, where employers um, seem to have uh, maybe confusions or misunderstandings or just, just don't know how to navigate in this really unprecedented situation. So we have uh, five questions and some answers, and we hope that if you have questions, you will ask them. Um, so this can be a bit of a dialogue. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of the plan for this morning. So I'm gonna share my screen. We have just a few slides. Um, here we go, hope that works. All right, so I hope that works. Dan, can you just confirm everything's good? I can see your screen, yeah. You can see my screen, okay, great. Uh, I've got to get it flipped, all right. All right, um, so our first question is, um, I'm concerned that my employees working from home are not productive, what do I do? Um, you know, and a lot of employers had to transition employees from office work to remote work at home on a, on a really quick basis. Offices shut down often overnight and um, trying to get employees really set up in their home offices and productive um, was definitely or, or has been I certainly a challenge for a lot of employers. Some employers were, were, were good to go beforehand, but I know many, many are, you know, had to do it uh, on a, a very quick basis. And so um, you know, that definitely couldn't have been easy. And, and you definitely want employees to be productive at home and to be accountable. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's difficult for them too. you know, they're experiencing, um, you know, having to, to work from home. Maybe they didn't do that before, or they have childcare or elder care obligations that they're dealing with and, um, they're distracted. So, uh, so there are definitely a lot of challenges to that. So employers who want to, um, who want to try to, Kind of keep track of what their employees are doing or are concerned that work really isn't getting done you know there there are things they can do to monitor workflow i mean some employers are using technology where employees log in they can see an employee's login time that certainly doesn't mean that an employee is actually productive while they're logging in but you, know, you can establish regular hours um you can you can do daily or weekly check-ins you can have employees um, respond to you or let you know when they've completed tasks or, or provide you with progress updates on a regular basis you know and um, a lot of employers are using video conferencing technology to do uh, to do kind of weekly meetings or daily meetings with their staff it's a really great way of, of connecting with staff making people feel like they're still part of a whole it can be really isolating to work at home so uh, so I know a lot of employers are, are having a lot of success with that. Um, we are with the Zoom um, just to, to bring this uh, seminar to you today. So that's um, it's definitely a good option. Um, you know, I had an interesting conversation with an employer earlier in the week, and we were talking about 
employees being productive and issues that they were having. And um, the employer said to me that from the beginning, they decided that um, they're going to have a trust mindset and they were just going to, they are going to, you know, obviously uh, assign work and monitor work, but they're going to assume that employees are getting the work done, assume that employees are managing their time, that they're letting the employer know if their project is completed so they can get new work. Um, and I think that has caused them, uh, it, it's, it's taken a lot of weight off them in terms of um, trying to manage employees. And, uh, you know, and certainly there's going to be outliers who take advantage of that. But I think that for, for management to, to go on the basis that, you know, my employees are being productive, I believe they're working, I believe they're doing their best under the circumstances. I think that is, uh, I think that's a really, a really healthy way to approach things if you can. Um, but if an employee is having challenges, if, you know, if they aren't being productive, I, I would certainly be asking them, why? You know, what's going on? What is the challenge? Is it because you're not set up properly in terms of technology? Is it because you have childcare obligations that you cannot manage during the day or that you need some relief from? Um, you know, and then you may have to consider other options in terms of, um, of hours of work or duties uh, to try to, you know, take the, the pressure off them in a sense if, uh, if, if they can't get the work done. Um, I don't know if I can ask Veronica. She and I are going to share the topics and she's going to kind of step in and add what she thinks uh, is relevant. Yeah, I, I asked Pamela saying it's interesting when she said that she had a client who was saying they're going to operate from trust. I've experienced the other end of the spectrum where um, we had a, I had a client who was, because of the rushed nature in which employees were sent to work from home, she felt that her group of staff hadn't been provided with enough structure and guidance. And so this client, and it's entirely appropriate, prepared a work from home agreement and had people commit to that. They had to sign on a work from home agreement and she arranged for that, that group of employees supervisor, again, to do regular check-ins. And so just to help, help orient people to what their responsibilities are to work from home, that also opened the floor to discussion. So again, watch how you deliver that stuff. If you just have people sign on a contract, sign on an agreement and there's no discussion, you may not learn that that person is actually experiencing a lot of anxiety because it's virtually possible, impossible for them to carry it out. Um, it's really important that you not make assumptions when people are working from home and that you explore possibly why they're not productive. And even an assumption like uh, in mine and Pamela's case, we're kind of opposite ends of the child spectrum. She's got younger kids, I've got teenage kids, but um, we've still got obligations to our kids to keep them on track. All our kids are homeschooling. And so that can interfere with the person's ability to work from home. So you may set established times and you might have set that, but then the school might have set some online class learning time and you've got to drag your 16 year old out of bed to get him going on something. And so that's why Pamela and I are both stressing it's important to have that discussion. The, the other thing we're finding is that sometimes employees are too stretched and they're, they're trying to work from home, but it's not working. And it's important to be mindful that if you can go without that employee to have the conversation that if they need to take a leave of absence, they can take a leave of absence and there is no threat to their employment to do so. And that, that's the important conversation to have because some employees might be hanging in there and trying their best to work and under functioning when what they really need to do is step down from work. And I believe the, the attendees here are aware or if not, that there's the Canada Emergency Response Benefit where people can apply for $2,000 uh, mid-month to mid-month, mid-March to mid-April, mid-April to mid-May, mid-May to mid-June. And they can get that $2,000 benefit. So you can have a discussion with the employee about taking a leave. Um, some employees are saying they wanna take a layoff, but it's important that you characterize this appropriately. If they're struggling to work and they can't work, you're not laying them off for a shortage of work you're providing them with the leave of absence. And, uh, and they have job protection through the Employment Standards Act on that. So you can have a conversation with them about that too, if you can manage to go without them. So that's another important conversation to have. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, are there any questions on this topic before we move to our next question? No. Uh, I don't see any questions that have come in at the moment. Uh, yeah, I can remind people that uh, if, you, if you do have a question, you can submit it through the question and answer box. Yeah, we're just, before we move to the next question, I, I will just direct people to the Employment Standards Act fact sheet 
that provides this job protection. This is a very specific leave of absence job protection that's been put in place um, by our provincial government for the duration of the COVID emergency. And sorry, we've got some double we don't Speaking. know why, so we're, let's go with it. Speaking of technological difficulties, we don't know why our screen is doubling up. But you'll see there that it's quite specific about the reasons that a person has job protection. Now, what often we get is then, well, are we allowed to put them on leave? That's an arrangement you can have with your employee. At any time, you and your employee can agree they can take an unpaid leave of absence. The point of this legislation is to provide job protection. So if a person has found themselves in the predicament of not being able to work for the list of reasons, they can go on a leave of absence and they don't need to worry that their employer may ultimately pull the pin on them. Um, and so you've got, and you'll see one of those listed uh, items is that the employer has directed them not to work due to concern about their exposure to others. So they're not all employee initiated or government initiated, such as quarantine and self-isolation. If, if an employer is concerned that the employee not work because they've shown up with a cough or something, but they don't qualify, they're, they're not evidently sick, but they're showing some symptoms, the employer can direct them not to work. Um, and that, that isn't necessarily segue with working from home, but that can be part of the conversation with them. So, but we, we do think it's important for you all to be aware that there is this job protected leave so that you don't turn around and tell someone you're being unreasonable in, in your request for a leave. Yeah, definitely a fantastic resource to have right now. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, not necessarily a question, but a comment uh, from uh, Charlene Smart, she just says she agrees that man managing expectations is critical right now. Absolutely. And that is, it's kind of a work in progress too, you know, you're, you're learning as you go and you may have to, you know, adjust your expectations going forward if it's just not working out or, or maybe employee can, they can do more from home than they originally thought they could. Well, I was going yeah. to say that too, sometimes you're managing them up, you may yeah. find that the employees really effective uh, and, and a little bored. They, they might have been doing too much mundane administrative work, so now might be the time to have them work on a project at home. So it, it may not be about like boring them to death, it might be about yeah. finding some stimulating work for them to do. Some people prefer working in pajamas, that's just the, you know, you're at their best, who knows. <laughs> All right. Um, there was a, a question that came in, as long as we have time. Oops, sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when an employee is sick, COVID or otherwise, during this crisis, how many times is reasonable and legal to call to connect with the employee to see how they are doing? We request permission to do so and want to stay connected because the rest of the team is holding their breath, so to speak, uh, until their well-being is confirmed or COVID-19 is confirmed. Yeah, I, I think you have to kind of take your cues from the employee. I mean, it's employers, if they don't check in, then they are, you know, the employees feel kind of left out. And, uh, and if they do check in too much, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> then employer, employees kind of feel like they've been harassed. And so, you know, I might, I might be frank about it. You know, is it okay if I check in with you later this week and see what an employee says? If they say, no, it's stressing me out that you're calling all the time, I'll let you know, then that's your answer. I would respect that as long as they provide uh, updates in a timely manner. And related to that, we do get questions about doctor's note and that fact sheet we just directed you to, it does make it clear that if it's, if it's a sickness reason right now, employees are not, you're not to, <laughs> to ask for doctor's notes because they're trying to, again, minimize the, um, the strain on our medical system. And doctors, for the most part, I think people know this, aren't attending to anyone personally anyway. So, uh, so the check-in's important. Um, I'd say no more than daily <laughs> and possibly less than that. If the person is sick, I'd give them two, three days. We, we are having people, I've had, I had a client say to me last week, well, my, a month ago, the employee said they had a cough and were taking their 14 day self-isolation. As soon as that expired, they said their wife had a cough and they were taking 14 days self-isolation. And as soon as that expired, I got an email saying for the health and safety of my family, I'm not coming to work. And we're going to talk more about that. Right. Well, I'll ask the question. next question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we will get to that if employees don't want to come to work. Um, but for question number two, to keep us on track, um, Veronica. This, this next one, uh, my employee wants me to pay the cost for setting up a home office. Do I have to? 
and so this this is a bit of a difficult issue employers have been encouraged to have employees work from home wherever possible it's not an absolute requirement through WorkSafe BC or provincial legislation. So again, if you look at the WorkSafe BC website on the employer obligations, employee obligations, COVID related, the obligations are to minimize the risk of infection and to encourage employees to work from home where possible. And, and so related to that, my concern for clients is if you start mandating that they work from home, you may be opening the door to possibly exposing yourself as an employer to covering those costs as, as a home office. So our advice has been encourage employees to work from home, discourage them from coming to work unless you need them here. But hopefully you don't have to take an absolute position on that. Now, um, on a to dial in on the legal requirements around the employer's obligations for home office related costs. The Employment Standards Act has a provision, Section 21, which is a little bit confusing because Section 21 says employers are prohibited from requiring employees directly or indirectly to contribute towards the costs of the employer's business by withholding wages, requiring wages be paid, or requiring employees to pay any money. So it, it, when you read that, it doesn't sound like it says the employer must pay the, uh, the, the employer must reimburse the employee for setting up a home office. But how this has been interpreted is that if an employee has to use their own money in order to carry out work on the benefit, for the benefit of the employer, the employer may be responsible for some of those costs. As employment standards in, the interpretation of that legislation sits now, what the branch has said is that the employer is not responsible for the infrastructure costs, the tools of cost, equipment, uh, but the employer is responsible for the costs associated with utilizing those products. So we're saying employers consider contributing to Wi-Fi. If the employee is using a personal cell phone and has had to you know, use a lot of data on their plan or go to an increased cell phone plan, uh, you defray the cost of personal use of, a, of business use of a personal cell phone. And so we are encouraging employers to put, set up some kind of reimbursement or allowance provision to offset the use of this tools and equipment. But under the Employment Standards Act so far, uh, the employers are not responsible for paying for the computers, paying for the furniture. So that's the strict interpretation of your costs. Um, but beyond that, you just may have some issues that, again, in relating to the first question, being my employees aren't being productive, you may learn that they have a home office on a budget and they're not being productive because they're working off a 10-year-old laptop. They're working off a very slow Wi-Fi and there's a huge Wi-Fi drain. They don't have a decent corner. They don't have a decent chair. They don't have a stand-up desk. So you might have some negotiation around that. If you want a productive employee, you may need to provide them some support in setting up that home office. Go ahead. Yeah, um, and I've, I've learned that the CRA has introduced a $500 tax-free benefit for um, employees reimbursing the cost of teleworking equipment. So if you are going to reimburse your employees for updating their router, getting a new cell phone plan, a new cell phone, printers, things like that, um, the employee can receive that reimbursement on a tax free basis. Certainly talk to your accountant, because I am not one, um, but um, that is available, as is there's an annual gift of $500 that employers can provide their employees. So that could also be used towards a reimbursement of, um, of, of equipment uh, used for a home office, perhaps a, a chair that, uh, that's suitable or, or you know a desk um, you know, and one of the things that came to my mind when I was thinking about all these employees working from home in, in, in offices is, uh, is confidentiality. And I think employers definitely need to turn their minds to having a question with their employees. Is your computer secure? Are you, if you have client files or 
customer files and you're working on at home, having conversations, financial information through home computers, um, is that is it secure? You know, uh, are there you know are there passwords? Who, who can overhear these conversations? Um, you know, because we've transitioned again to working from home, um, but those are really important considerations. Like, how is that employee set up, and is it appropriate um, for the type of information? that they're dealing with. Um, and also, you know, if an employee has accommodation needs, perhaps they were using a stand-up desk in your office, you know, they, they do have your accommodation re requirements as an employer, they do translate into the home office as well. So that's something that you may have to assist them with to make sure that they're set up properly at home. And uh, relating to Pamela's comment on confidentiality, if there, you do have this issue of uh, the security uh, the cyber security issues around an employee working from home. And again, this kind of feeds back to the business cost is you know you don't have to pay for Norton, but you might want to pay for the Norton upgrade to a paying Norton security program or to make sure that your own IT people have properly that your employee's computer has adequate security features on it. And then you'll probably cover that cost because you want to protect your business. So keep, keep those items in mind too. All right, any questions, comments? Uh, okay. I think you were both pretty thorough on that. It hasn't elicited any questions at this point, so feel free to continue. All right, our third question. See, it keeps getting more and more interesting. Um, so uh, the question is, we are approaching the end of the no longer 13, but 16 week layoff period. What are my options? And I, this was just, um, put out a few days ago, a day or two ago, the employment standards regulation has increased the temporary layoff period for COVID related layoffs up to 16 weeks in a 20 week period. So employers have a longer period of time now to figure out what to do with their employees and, and you know, and how their employee and how their business is going to recover um, from, uh, from all the social isolation. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. We came across it just by accident because it didn't seem to have been announced very well. But um, so that's the current status of layoff periods. It can be 16 weeks in a 20 week period. Um, so what are your options? You know, we, now we have a bit longer to figure out what to do. We were, we're probably around what seven weeks in for most employers or um, or eight weeks in even, um, maybe six weeks. But in any case, we were approaching the end. And I think that start to consider, you know, can I return employees to work? Um, what's it gonna look like? You know, is, are things picking back up again for me? And one thing to think about is that a layoff is if uh, an employee is working less than 50% or earning less than 50% of their regular wages. So if you can bring an employee back on a, like a, a part-time basis for a week and you can um, you can that wouldn't be considered a layoff week so you can basically extend that 16 weeks longer because you have you know maybe a couple weeks of non layoff in there um, so it lasts 18 weeks uh, instead of 16 so um, that's definitely something to consider if you can get people working even on the serve you can earn um, you know up to a thousand dollars so um, well, during the, the month period. So in any case, it's definitely worth thinking about. Um, however, if you are thinking, listen, we're coming to the end of the layoff period and my business is looking much different than it used to look. I, I have, you know, 10 staff members and I do not have a place for those, those staff members to go. Technically, if you don't recall an employee at the end of a layoff period, it is a termination. So, um, so, you know, that triggers sometimes, or well, it would trigger in the normal course, uh, obligation to provide severance pay. And um, so, you know, if you are reaching the end of the, the layoff period and you're thinking, well, I'm not sure where things stand. Things, I might be able to bring people back, I might not, um, or just give me a couple more weeks, I know I'll be, I'll be able to bring people back. My recommendation is I wouldn't be pulling out the checkbooks, um, you know, on the, the exact day of uh, 16 weeks and saying, okay, I'm gonna pay out severance to everyone. I would probably, uh, I would recommend contacting employees and, and staying in touch about the status of the business, about your plans for reopening. If you can get them back to work in two weeks, you know, they may agree to that because in these conditions, having a job um, is probably better than not having a job. And so if, they, uh, if, they're, if they're terminated, that means they're gonna be looking for a job. So in any case, I, I think that communication is, is so valuable and that, you know, and, and keeping in touch and, and letting people know your plans is definitely a way to, to hopefully bring people back even after the 16 weeks. Um, but if you're sure that it's not gonna happen, that you, are, you have employees who you will not be able to return to work, then, um, 
then it, it's, it, you know, it, we, we look into, do we have to pay severance or not? And under section 65 of the Employment Standards Act, where there is, where, where an employment contract is impossible to perform, an employer is relieved of the obligation to pay severance. And that has been um, clarified as well for COVID that if, if employment is impossible to perform due to COVID, um, then, uh, then the employer doesn't have to pay severance. So if you have employees that are, it's impossible to bring them back, then you may be relieved from your obligation to pay severance pay under the Employment Standards Act or the common law. Um, but impossible to perform is a very high standard. And so, you know, if you have a space for five employees, but not for 10, does that mean the other five, it, it's impossible to perform their positions? I think it gets tricky. I, and in those cases, I would say you should probably get legal advice. <laughs> um, but it's, it's certainly, it's certainly worth considering, um, you know, and if you, you know, if you are able to pay severance, maybe you just go down that route to be safe. But if it's truly is impossible, you're not reopening a division, you're not, you know, this role won't exist anymore afterwards, then, then you may, you may be in luck in terms of um, being saved from that expense. Um, Veronica, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I, I want to build on what Pamela was saying about this awareness that uh, for COVID related layoffs under the legislation employment terminates at 16 weeks. This, it occurs by virtue of the Employment Standards Act, but again, it takes either the employer or the employee crystallizing that act. And so this is building on what Pamela was saying is, at the 16 week mark, you don't necessarily need to formalize FYI employee, you're no longer our employee. Um, and in a way, that, that isn't a new thing to do. Uh, we've had clients in the forestry industry that regularly had layoffs beyond 13 weeks. Um, and you know, in other resource-based industries. And the employees would just wait and they go on layoff, they collect their EI, but currently it's the CERB. And then they know they've still got employment, so they come back and that happens year after year. And so I think what Pamela is saying about, it's really important to stay in touch with your people and to provide them what work that you can work. Most people aren't looking for a big severance payout right now. Most people are concerned the employers couldn't even pay the severance payout. So it's one thing having that obligation, it's another thing having the ability to pay. And so the, the really important thing is to keep in touch and to provide work where you can. And again, you've got many employees still with school closures, daycare closures, that they may still need to stay off work. So they, they may be sweating, going, I don't want my employment to terminate, but I have this dilemma. I don't have school or daycare. So, and it's virtually impossible to work from home. I just want to stay on layoff for longer. And so many employees may just be perfectly, I don't want to say happy, but accepting that their layoff may go for longer. Um, I'll give a specific example too of even where a, a role is identified as redundant. I had a client approach me in the hospitality industry saying, I have an events coordinator. There are no events. There won't be events for 2020. And God knows when they'll start in 2021. And so again, we had this discussion about, well, possibly you have no obligation for severance because this is a pandemic driven redundancy. But I said, do you value this person? Um, can, can you give them hours at the front desk? Because they can make another thousand a month while they're on the CERB. And if and when the CERB ends, they can make additional money while they're on EI. That way you're maintaining the employment relationship. You're maintaining a person, a role that you will need a year from now, 18 months from now. And, and that person might, might accept that arrangement. So yeah, don't, don't rush to sever and formalize the severance of that employment relationship. I think we have some questions. I yeah, saw. we got some questions now. Yeah. So, uh, there's a one person that says they have work, but employees don't want to come back because they make more money on CERB. So what can they do? Do, do they have to keep their jobs? Yeah, let's question part that. four. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there. I want to reopen, but my employees are resisting. We will talk about that because absolutely we're hearing that from employers. Okay. Yes. yes. So back, back to another question that was related to the current topic. Um, well, what does the employee do after... 16 weeks if the job is possible with the company uh how do we let employees know what to do do they wait do they continue with ei benefits is that possible 
Yeah. Well, it's we we actually don't know what's impossible yet. I guess for your individual business, you may know that aspect's done, and you are never reopening that again. And so you're, you, you really do have both those obligations. One is you can keep in touch with the employee and just say, I still have no work. I still have no work. If you have laid off employees um, as a result of COVID or for any other reason, that employee is eligible to receive EI benefits for typically, and again, depending on someone's entitlement, it could change, but typically up to a year. And so, that person, it makes no difference to their EI whether you temporarily laid them off or now you're saying it's a termination of employment. Either way, they're EI eligible. Currently, the way the CERB is working, which is a bit difficult, is that anyone on layoff got pushed over to the CERB. When the CERB is over, if you haven't recalled that person back to work, they have to, they'll go back into the EI system. And the other rather confusing part about this process is that if a person applied for EI and got pushed over to the CERB, they're still in the EI stream such that they're being required to go through the EI stream to report earnings. If a person got laid off and didn't apply through Service Canada, but just went through their CRA My account and applied for the CERB, they're not having to declare their earnings. So it's a bit confusing because we've got some people saying, well, Service Canada is saying declare my earnings. CERB is saying just attest that you don't have more than a thousand a month. But regardless of the outcome, the, the outcome of this is that for the duration that a person is receiving CERB, their EI entitlement is effectively on hold. So if the CERB goes for four months, that employee, and you still can't bring that employee back, they can collect EI for a total of approximately 12 months plus the serve. So you've got time. So you don't need to formalize that end of the employment relationship. Formalizing the end of the relationship might motivate someone to start asking for severance pay. And so in many cases, we're saying lay low, keep in touch with the employee and say that hasn't picked up yet. And perhaps one day you can bring them back. Or perhaps one day they'll find other work. And they'll just naturally move on. Any other questions? Uh, no one of the questions at this time, so feel free to move on. Thanks so much. Okay, the, uh, the, the other question the is question. now our number four. Is that mine? That's yours. Okay. Yeah. This one, I want to reopen, but my employees are resisting returning to work. And also some businesses didn't fully close, but they've retracted their business and now they want to expand. And, and yes, there is a concern by many of our clients that people are resisting returning to work because they are collecting the serve. Uh, Pamela and I can't stress enough, don't make assumptions as to why someone is resisting returning to work. Um, there, there could be any number of reasons. The person may feel unsafe at work. And again, that's a very relative experience we're finding, is that we've got some people that are saying, I am fine with it, I'm comfortable, I know I need to wash my hands. We've got others that want to be fully draped in personal protective equipment before they come back to work. Um, if you're a unionized workplace, we've got some unions encouraging employees to stay away from work. And so sometimes it's feedback or pressure from their union representatives, um, which you may or may not learn about. But people might have childcare school obligations. And again, they, <laughs> this might relate back to that first issue of the productivity issue when they were working at home, that they are, as much as they were struggling at home, they could at least take care of their kids, but they may not want to admit that regardless of the age of their kids, that they really don't want to come back to work because they really feel they need to be at home shepherding their kids. Kids are going through a lot of social isolation, anxiety, stress, struggling with their schoolwork. So regardless of that age of that kid, right up to if it's a college student come home, they may need a, a higher level of parental support. And the parent may not want to admit that. Um, some people might be experiencing anxiety and depression or conditions verging on mental illness. It's probably situational unless they already have a systemic mental illness. 
but that employee may not want to tell you that all they do is sit at home and cry every day and that they're in no shape to come to work. And so it, it's really important to have a conversation around that in, in terms of understanding why they're not returning to work. Um, again, be mindful that the employees, they may not all be aware that they can earn $1,000 a month and still collect the CERB. Um, they may not be aware that if ultimately the CERB ends, they can go on EI and there's a provision in the Employment Insurance Act to allow employees to make up to 90% of their earnings with a 50% clawback on their EI before they get no EI. So an example of that is if you bring an employee back and pay them 500 a month, their EI would reduce by 250, but they're still making more money combined. So some employees might need to understand that too, that they're saying, well, why should I return to work and lose my 2000? Or if you can't give me full time, even three months from now, lose my EI. So they might need to understand they're not going to lose, necessarily lose that benefit and you're willing to work with them to enable them to get the benefit of CERB or later EI while some additional earnings. So yeah, have, have, that, have that conversation. Um, and then Pamela, you have some comments about like the order of people, selecting the order of people. To... Yeah, you know, and I, I also wanted to add that um, when we opened up the, uh, the screen before on leaves of absence, that employee choice is not a legitimate reason for a leave of absence. So if it really comes down to it and the employee um, is concerned about coming back, like that example Veronica said earlier about, you know, first it was they felt sick, then it was a family member felt sick, then it was simply that, it's, you know, they're worried about their family's health and safety. Technically, that doesn't form, a, uh, you know, a legitimate basis to, to refuse to come back to work. Um, so you may be looking at, um, ultimately, is it a resignation or not? And if an employee, will, you know, won't come back. But you know, I would prefer in most cases not to be having that argument. If you have employees who are interested in returning to work, there are some people um, who, you know, who, who, who want to come back, who want to earn more money, who want separation from their house or, you know, they, uh, they may be the ones to get, get them back to work first, you know, and if someone is resisting, maybe there's someone who comes back later on when they feel more comfortable. Um, so I, I'd be talking to people to make sure that, you know, I've identified who is, you know, who is ready and able to return and who, and, and who really doesn't want to. And then I can prioritize those employees. Um, and before employees come back, I also, I would recommend ensuring that you are following all, you know, all safety protocol that applies to your business. Um, you know, it, you have to have turned your mind to that. How am I going to keep employees safe at work? Um, and, and, you know, we've seen situations where work safe audits, um, audits businesses. Have you, you know, do you have safety protocols in place that are reasonable? Have employees been trained? Do they understand um, what the expectations are around that? And so if, if employees do have safety concerns, make sure you've already dealt with that on the front end before you have to, um, you know, before you have to respond and start making changes to kind of get up to speed. So um, yeah, so I, I say definitely look into that. So at least you can, you can uh, appease uh, people if they have those concerns. And on this employee resistance for rather vague reasons, like my example, the health and safety of the employee, Again, as Pamela is saying, I, we'd really ra you'd rather not throw down the gauntlet and say, we're treating this as job abandonment. We're treating this as a resignation. The relationship is over. But what you can do is manage their expectation about when they're returning in terms of saying to them, your reasons that you're giving you know, don't qualify you for job protection. So what you need to understand is I'm willing to grant you a personal leave, um, but when and if you're ready, I might not be able to take you back. You, you don't get to say, now I'm ready to come back, give me work. So I need you now, but if you're not ready to come back now, I'll bring in someone else and you may have to wait until I actually need you down the line. That's probably the better approach than saying you're fired. Yeah, or I'm treating this as a resignation. So, but manage their expectation then. That yeah. they, they don't get, the tail doesn't get to wag the dog. Mm -hmm. They don't get to say, well, I don't want to come now for some vague reason. Right. And put but, it in writing. Yes. Yeah, confirm this in an email or a letter um, because it really is good to have that later It's on. very important to have that because of this Employment Standards Act job protection. Uh, employees can file these Employment Standards Act complaints claiming that you didn't comply with the job protection. So it's really important you have that reason in writing. Right. And if they will only verbally tell you, you do need to at least confirm it in writing in an email. There's a lot of texting going on. If you have to, screenshot that text, make sure you've got the date, make sure you've got the time screenshotted. 
um, but just somehow you need to get that get that position in writing. Yeah. And also related to this, this is a bit of a segue, but on the Employment Standards Act complaints, um, the, the government removed a, a preliminary process in the Employment Standards Act complaint process, which was really unfortunate. And that was called a request for payment process, where if an employee felt there'd been a violation of the Employment Standards Act, the employee could send a form letter downloaded from the branch's website to their employer saying, you didn't pay me all my vacation pay. You didn't pay me my severance pay. I'm missing some overtime pay. You know, you didn't return me to work after my COVID protected, job protected leave. And the employer could address that directly with the employee, usually with the benefit of legal advice because the letter was official enough it would scare employers to get some legal advice. Um, but the, the government for reasons just baffle, baffle me, um, decided in their wisdom to take that away. So employers are now only learning that there's an employment standards issue when that complaint lands on their desk. In taking away that preliminary process, the government didn't staff up the offices. So pre-COVID, complaints were piling up. Petty complaint, not petty. Well, they might be petty. Petty, minor complaints, major, minor, petty, all piling up into the system. Our clients pre-COVID were experiencing They'd learn of complaints six months, eight months after the employee had filed the complaint. Your employee might file a complaint against you, be back at work, and you have no idea. Yeah. And they have no idea, and they're uncomfortable because they don't know when you're going to hear about it. And so they're waiting, 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 and you have no idea, and then you're caught by surprise one day. And there are no retaliation provisions. When that complaint lands on your desk, you don't get to turn around and fire that employee. So add the COVID pandemic and the number of complaints, it could be a year or later before you learn you have a complaint. So ergo the importance of getting things in writing. Memories fade and it's, it's difficult to remember exactly how conversations happened. So absolutely, get things in writing. All right, any questions on this yeah, one? Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, so someone wants to know, can you rehire somebody else for someone who was previously laid off? Maybe there's some employees that you don't want to return and you want somebody in their place. Uh, is that a fresh hire? or a repositioning your existing group of employees? I don't know. From the, the way that the question reads, uh, it looks like if you lay off a group of employees and you only want to bring back a select few of them, mm, some of them haven't returned because the employees that came back can do essentially their job, take on some of those duties, can you rehire somebody else? You, you can, well, you're looking at likely paying a severance if you're if if it's possible to bring them back but you're choosing not to so you have that uh to consider um if you're choosing some employees over others for reasons that could be interpreted as discriminatory uh, maybe you don't want to bring back older workers uh using this as a reason to get rid of them or someone required a lot of accommodation previously because of a medical condition um so you you know you have to be able to explain the rationale behind your choice if that becomes an issue um but you know, but you can always terminate employees and, and keep the ones who are who are more effective. Um, and do you need to add, Veronica? Well, and Pamela addressed this. I don't know if it was at the beginning of this or another question where she said there, you might have this situation where like you had a 10 employee workforce, but as a result of the COVID pandemic, currently you can only bring back one or two and you're anticipating maybe maxing out at five, although it's hard to know. And then again, you're being selective about which ones you bring back. And that's again where we say, start with the ones that want to work. Mm -hmm. And you probably have a meeting of the minds that the ones you want to bring back are the ones that want to work in most cases. And ultimately, you may have an argument that you're saved from a severance responsibility because for COVID related reasons, it was impossible to bring back 10 people. It was possible to bring back five. And, and, but as Pamela is saying, that may save you on the severance, but it may not save you from a human rights complaint that coincidentally, the five you didn't bring back were all your over 60 workers or your a couple of over 60 workers plus a couple of people with some pretty debilitating health conditions, but not so debilitating they can't work. So yeah, be, care be careful in your selection. And again, a lot of this is about the conversation with the employees you may find some of these people, they don't want to come back to work. So it, it's important to have some preliminary conversations because you might be sweating it about not bringing someone back who's a 20 year employee and a potentially very large severance package. And you might find they're burnt out, 
they're done and they just want nothing more than to collect their EI for a year and get some breathing room. So have some preliminary conversations about where people's minds are at in terms of returning to work. Okay, maybe I'll ask uh, one more question. There's definitely a few more in the hopper, but uh, I'll give you guys a chance to get through your slides and maybe if there's time at the end, we can go through the rest of them. But um, do you have to bring back uh, employees of the same number of hours they previously worked? Oh. Uh, question number five. Question number five, yeah. <laughs> Should See, we these are that? the key questions. Yeah. Should we just flip to that? We'll just and then, move. Yeah. then Dan, you can add you put some questions at the end. Yeah, we'll get this one done. Um, yeah, so this is something, you know, I, let's just say you can bring people back, um, but, but things aren't, aren't back to normal. Can you change terms and conditions of employment for returning employees? And, and by changing terms and conditions, I'm saying things like, you know, can you reduce their hours, um, bring them back at, at shorter hours, different days of the week, reduce their wages? Um, give them different duties, combine two positions in one and say, listen, you're going to do both these roles. When you come back, maybe cancel a benefits plan or a bonus plan that you had in place. You know, like, what are you considering doing to make your business viable going forward and to keep people employed? Um, you know, and whenever you make a, a large change, you are exposed to kind of an argument that there has been a constructive dismissal, which is really just an employee's contract of employment has changed so much that it's essentially a termination, the change you're imposing. Um, so it, it triggers for the employee, if they choose to, they can, they can claim um, a severance because you're, you're making these significant changes to their work. Um, you know, and, and one of the key things about a, uh, a, you know, a, a significant change is that it's only a constructive dismissal if an employee doesn't agree. And I think that it kind of goes back to our, kind of a, our theme um, in all the questions we've been talking about is about communication. And, you know, if employees understand the rationale for the changes, if there's a wage decrease of, let's say, 25%, but you, you, you tell the employee, listen, I'm confirming it will only be in place for six months, um, they may agree to it. You know, they may agree to come back on reduced hours because they can earn money under the CERB or they can earn some money if they're collecting EI. So, you know, you, you may have options, but I think sometimes if, if changes are just imposed on employees and, and they feel like they, they're kind of backed into a corner, they, uh, they often don't respond so well. But if, if employers are open about this is the reason, I really want to keep you, you're very valuable, but I can, you know, in order for me to keep the business going, I have to make these changes. Uh, and you, know, and you have that kind of a trust relationship with, with employees, then you, know, you may be able to, um, to, to do these things. But I think if you're just going to tell employees, nope, we're bringing you back at 75% of your, you know, former salary, then, then you may just, you may run into problems. Um, you want me to add to that? Yeah, it, we, we get a lot of questions from clients about if I do this, is it a constructive dismissal? Or the employee has said, if you do that, it's a constructive dismissal. And I, uh, there is both a combination of an, uh, the, my employer clients being overly fearful of a constructive dismissal and individuals, employees, not really understanding what a constructive dismissal, what, what it takes to actually enforce your position that you have a constructive dismissal. And unfortunately, this, this, appre this fear and this misunderstanding is being fueled by a lot of postings and articles and <laughs> being written by my colleagues mm -hmm. about this constructive dismissal business. So, I'm keeping an eye on articles being written by lawyers who work for individuals, employees or former employees. And I'm seeing them say, go tell your employer it's a constructive dismissal. Yeah. Don't accept it. Write a note to say that you don't accept the yeah. change. And, you know, and, and it's, it's really unfortunate because th there's some key components to asserting a constructive dismissal. And one of them is that the employee quit their job. And so if the employer says, well, unfortunately, you know, the, the well is dry and I'm going to go into further debt and have water trucked up the hill so I can, you know, use that $40,000 business loan to pay you. But in order to keep all my valued employees, I need to reduce wages. And again, this is where Pamela's saying, part of that's the conversation, is, is to say to the employee, I, I realize that what you're saying is this is a constructive dismissal, but it's the best I can do. If the employee doesn't like it, they actually need to quit say it's a constructive dismissal and sue their employer or at a minimum file an employment standards complaint to get a maximum of eight weeks severance pay 
and they've walked away from a job, possibly to no other work, for all of eight weeks severance pay, which they may not even realize, given that the whole employment standards system is just going to be drowning, they may not even see that money for a year or two. And so it, it's this, and when an employee draws that line in the sand, be mindful they may not understand what it means to actually implement that line in the sand. You know, and another pot, potential prospect an employee can do is say, well, I'll continue to work for you, but I'm going to sue you for that additional 25%. Now that's lots of fun to work for your employer while you're taking them through court to recover that 25% shortage. So that is another option for employees. But I, in my first 10, 15 years, I represented a lot of individuals or advised them. I didn't, and I would say to them, do you realize this is what it takes? That you, you actually need to either quit or stay working for your employer, tell them you disagree, and I'm going to sue you while I work for you. And so that often changes the conversation. Um, not that, again, you want to be giving your employees the advice, but I go back to having that conversation, not being overly fearful about this issue of my employer said it's a constructive dismissal. It's, the conversation is, I appreciate it's a, it's a change, but it's the best I can do right now. And then really, the ball's in the employee's court to either accept it or walk away and commence a lawsuit over it. And um, it, they're, they're rare cases, constructive yeah. dismissal. It is, it is very difficult to make out constructive dismissal. Yeah, and if it's a, a decrease of 25%, then their, their claim is for only 25% of their income over their notice period, whatever that would be. And they're, they're still out of work at the end. Yeah, of they've walked away from 75% to gain 25%. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult path to take. And, and yeah, and we, we keep seeing articles where it, employees are almost encouraged to do that. But the fact is you don't have a job at the end. And in this market, you know, is that really where you want to be? Um, you know, the yeah. other component, sorry, Pamela, yeah. on a constructive dismissal is the courts have said, we're looking, if the employer is doing their best to preserve salary or compensation, fundamental compensation terms, or it's a temporary change, the employers are looking for a, a component of the change being demeaning or humiliating. So watch that when you're reorganizing or bringing people back. If you're bringing back your chief financial officer as the accounts payable person, you've got a problem. That's demeaning and humiliating, even if you barely touch their compensation they would have a right to walk away. And so when you're looking at a reorganization, be careful to place your people. And again, people may accept, I gave you this example of this events coordinator, and I don't know, my client hasn't had this discussion, but she may accept quite menial work in the interim in order to keep the door open to having that job down the line. So have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But it, it, the one part that the courts have been clear about is that if, if the change is demeaning and humiliating from a reasonable person's perspective, um, they will let a person walk away from a full salary and award that as severance. Yeah, one thing to consider right now too is, you know, if you don't think you'll be able to bring people back at their full hours, it's an opportunity now to start applying for that work sharing program um, because you could have employees, you know, coming back you know, half time sharing a position and then getting topped up by EI. So if, you know, we, we have this extension of the temporary layoff period, it does give employers an opportunity to, to get those applications in uh, to, you know, to be ready for when employees come to work and to have the, the best situation they can for employees. And yeah, so keep that in mind as well. In the Service Canada Work Share Program, Pamela is more familiar with this than me. You were telling me that it's, there's a 30 day. There is, yeah. If you so, can explain that. Yeah, um, I, and I, I don't know if I can explain it, <laughs> no, but I do know that there is a 30-day waiting period to start the program. And so, you know, you aren't looking at starting it in two weeks. It has to, um, there's at least, yeah, 30 days. I think, I'm not sure if it's from the application date or from the approval date, but, um, but yeah, it's not something that you're going to get approved for overnight, which is why now is the time to put in the legwork to get that to get that application in and to get a plan in place so that um, that you're ready when uh, you know when businesses reopen when you know our community starts moving again and you can do work shares for a business just individual work work unit areas like I could apply say for a work share for the administrative staff right. and that way too when the serve ends they can continue to get their EI work for you a little bit and, it, and again have top-ups without having an EI clawback so the, the work share can be valuable but it is a fairly involved process to apply. Yeah, and it, it's not approved overnight. And with Service Canada being inundated, you know, assisting with processing mm -hmm. CERB, it might take even yeah. longer.
they, they've taken some of the requirements or less than some of the requirements for the workshop program because of COVID. Um, so I think some of the application uh, components are a little easier, um, like the restoring business component. Um, but still, yeah, it, it definitely look into that and it will take some effort. Yeah. I think those are our, those are our questions. So we are at 9.56. We have a little bit of time. We got four minutes. So we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. Of course, we might not be able to get to all of them. But uh, So if an employee's duties have changed and they must uh, perform cleaning or disinfecting for COVID, can they refuse? Well, it depends. <laughs> yeah, are, are, you, lawyers, are so. you telling your senior manager that they're coming back as the, you know, in-house janitorial person? Again, we're in the demeaning and humiliating. But if, if a component of everyone's job is regular cleaning and sanitizing, again, in the context of COVID and providing a health and safety workplace and meeting work safety C requirements, yeah, that's, that's a fair requirement. Say everybody's got to pitch in and sanitize clean regularly, Take turns and you know, yeah, have a, have a schedule, you know, have it by the coffee machine, make it clear that everyone's got that responsibility. So I would say if that's a component of the job you're adding in, you're fine. And it's probably prudent to do so because WorkSafe BC, if they audit you, they want to know what you're doing to regularly sanitize and clean. Yeah. I mean, if, if someone really resists and it was never part of their position, um, then I don't know how much I'd be requiring them, but I, I think there's a team approach here and I think that it's risky from their perspective to see all their other kind of staff members doing that work and then, you know, and they don't want to, unless of course they are, have, have some sort of health reason for not wanting to do that. But um, again, I, I, would, I would try to make it the norm in the workplace and, and hope that people will comply. Okay, uh, so somebody else has a, uh, an employee on uh, non-COVID related medical leave. Uh, they're ready to come back to work, but they don't have work ready for them. Do they extend their medical leave or process uh, ROE for shortage of work? Will they be able to collect EI or serve benefits? That was Pamela's <laughs> webinar last week. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Kind of. I, um, I, well, if you don't have work for them, then they, their leave transitions from a, a medical leave to a layoff. Um, so, I mean, I would, I would likely want them to, to provide, uh, you know, doctor certification that they're able to return to work if it's been a longer medical leave. Um, but if, you know, if, if you have to, um, keep them off work longer then that's just, you know, you don't have the work, you don't have the work and they get treated like other employees and put on layoff. In terms of following a new ROE, that's always something I have to look up in the moment. I think if, if nothing, if they're just transitioning to a different type of leave, I don't, they yeah, have to file a new ROE. The yeah, the technical obligation to file a record of employment it, it comes from when there's a a, um, a cessation of earnings, and mm -hmm. so if they've already gone on leave and you filed a sick leave record of employment, you're not technically required to file a record of employment confirming that it's now a shortage of work. Code A layoff. There's no layoff code. The layoff is code A, and the terminology is shortage of work. And that you can use that code for layoffs dismissals, permanent layoffs, anytime you have, for whatever reason, a shortage of work. Um, but I, again, I say don't die on your sword over that because the employee may feel that they just can't transfer to EI benefits. So typically, I say to clients, just provide them with something in writing confirming that we have no work due to COVID and so we're converting you to layoff status. And typically, I say to them, so apply for EI and EI will contact the employer if they need a record of employment. But if the employee's getting in a tizzy over it, issue a record of employment. And so, um, and typically it's an amended, it's not a fresh one, it's an amended record of employment. And now you're changing the coding from an EI illness injury leave to a shortage of work. Right. So it, it's not required, but don't die on your sword over it. Just yeah. It changes whatever. the benefits they're going to receive from EI sick benefits yeah. to the CERB if it's still happening at that time or, or regular EI. So, you know, they're... Yeah, it does need to be notified in a sense, but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. Definitely. Okay. Uh, I, I think we're at time. Um, so if, if anybody did have more questions, I apologize that we didn't get to some of them. How might they uh, be able to reach out to you if they have more questions or need legal advice? Um, you can contact us at our office. Um, our, you can find us online. Our information. I guess oh, if you go back to the first page. So you can reach our office. Our office manager, Stephanie Webb, does intakes. 
we I do have to caution people that we don't just provide like ask an email question, provide email advice. We've got mm -hmm. we've got to enter into retainer relationships with our clients and open files and understand billing arrangements and then you know and then provide provide the legal advice. So we're always happy to do if there's the energy and desire for it to do another uh, seminar through the chamber or through other um, associations or groups that you may have, because that's just more efficient way. Um, but yeah, by all means, contact our office. You see on the top right of the screen, we've got the office manager's email, and yeah, she she screens and does the, uh, the client intakes. Okay. Well, thank you uh, both so much for your time, Veronica, Pamela. Your expertise is very much appreciated, and uh, yeah, we value it. So thank you for sharing it with the chamber members and for being here. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to the chamber members, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your support. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us if you need anything or if uh, there's another topic that you hope that we can do another webinar about. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you again so much for joining and we'll, uh, we'll sign off and see you next time. Thanks again, Pamela and Veronica. Thank you.